Welcome to Money Making Conversations. I am your host, Rashawn McDonald. It is time, like I say every week, to stop reading other people's success stories and really start writing your own. I always talk about gifts. You hear people talk about your passion. I say, if you have a gift, lead with your gifts. And don't let your age, friends, family, or coworkers stop you from planning or living your dreams. My interviews that I do on Money Making Conversations are for you. I interview celebrities, CEOs, entrepreneurs, and people I like to call industry decision makers. My guess is perfect from that statement that I led with, leading with your gifts and don't let your age, friends, family, or coworkers stop you from planning or living your dreams. Because his book is about pushing through failure because that sets you up for success. His name is Ryan Leak. He's an author, speaker, executive coach, and podcaster. He's known for two documentaries, The Surprise Wedding and Chasing Failure. Ryan's career is split 50% speaking in churches and 50% doing executive coaching through his company, The Ryan Leak Company. He's on the show to talk about his new book, Chasing Failure, How Falling Short Sets You Up for Success. It's stated in his book, kids can dream uninterrupted because their failure has not yet become something that they fear. In the book, Chasing Failure, Ryan lays out the framework you need to chase failure successfully, which means living a life where you are pursuing your dreams, living in your purpose, and, exp- and experiencing fulfillment. Please welcome the Money Making Conversation. I hope I laid it out well for him, Ryan Leak. <laughs> hey, it's an honor to be here. So glad to be on the show. Well, good, my friend. Uh, and I'm going to let you know, uh, one, of my, one of my little mentees, uh, Ricky Smiley. Kind of remind me a little bit of Ricky Smiley here, Ryan. I'm just going to let you know that, man. Kinda look, I looked at you and I said, that's what looks just like a little Ricky Smiley there, but that's a compliment because he's handsome and you're a handsome guy, too. That so. is a compliment. I love Rick. Yeah, Rick's a good people, man. We talk about yeah. at least two, three, two or three times a month about stuff like yeah. this, about chasing the dreams, about uh, position yourself for success. Now, yeah. this is what, the fifth version of uh, uh, an edition, I should say, of Chasing yeah. Failure? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the the first one was really just the story of, of me trying out for the Phoenix Suns and, mm-hmm. you know, diving into the surprise wedding. So that was only about 60 pages. Mm-hmm. Found some typos in it, which is the thing every author hates to hear. And, mm-hmm. you know, right. we kind of kept trying to revisit it and rebrand it, but it just, well, in, in my estimation, you know, kept kept failing. And so... Um, so, you know, five years later, when having a conversation with my literary agent about, Hey, I think you need to, to squeeze this lemon again. And I'm thinking like, Hey, that, that's that I, I already talked about that. And, <laughs> and she challenged me, she challenged me. She said, yeah, but you didn't, you didn't actually market it. You didn't actually like really write like a book book. Right. So how about you actually write a book book this time? Mm-hmm. And so I said, all right, let's do it. And, and so here, here we are again. And uh, if at first you don't succeed, then maybe you should try again. Well, I'm going to jump right into it because on the fourth version, we talk in the book, it talks about shame and shame is always tied to failure. Cause I'm going to go right there. Cause I wanted to talk about the version because I feel that that stops a lot of people, you know, the fear of failure, fear of what people would think. And I thought that Mm -hmm. chapter should be the proper chapter to start out in this conversation Mm -hmm. with, because I think it stops a tremendous amount of people. I'm not going to put a percentage on that, but I know I talk to a lot of people. I I motivate a lot of people and it's always tied to the what if. So talk about the fourth version and that shame and the fear of failure wrapped up into that chapter. Well, you know, there can be a lot of, uh, what what are people thinking about this? Mm -hmm. Um, What are, are people going to, shame me how much of that shame is something that i put on myself Mm -hmm. what are the expect who's writing the rules right at some point you got to ask yourself that question Mm -hmm. who's making up the rules to say this is how things have to look Mm -hmm. and so at some point you got to wake up and go okay what 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 do i what do i actually really want to do and do i believe that it can actually make a difference and add value to people's life and if it can Mm -hmm. then we should just go for it and not wait for other people's permission to do what God has already gifted us to do. Right. And so sometimes we're looking for somebody else's approval before we make decisions or take next steps. And there's so much of a, man, how, how are they going to make me feel? But what I've tried to do in this book is almost reverse that a little bit of going, hey, you know, you, you need to make a decision about how you're going to feel before you do something, not after. You know, it's really interesting because I, I, I cited that quote and it came from the foreword of your book, kids can dream uninterrupted because their failure has not yet become something that they fear. Right. And and we always, I have a daughter 
and I was always mm-hmm. see kids. They always have. I, I can remember as a kid, I would sit down looking at a television show, and I wanted to be on TV, or I wanted to. Uh, I remember I wanted to uh, saw some things offshore, and I wanted to be. I wanted to work offshore, and eventually in life, I did work offshore. And so, mm-hmm. for how I got there, uh, was it tied to my wish as a kid? All I know is nobody stopped me from mm-hmm. that dream or that process. And so when I look mm-hmm. at you, I know that's a word that's been out there a lot because of the Philadelphia 76ers, the process. There's a process when you're talking, Ryan, about chasing your dreams. In your book, when I said it right here, you outline it. What is the process? Let's start there. Is it just having the idea or just having the aspiration? But what is the process of fulfilling or chasing your dream? Well, I think what often happens, you know, people ask me, Ryan, do you really believe that I should shoot for the moon? I say, absolutely. Yes. You just need to know what it costs to get to the moon. You should also know that very few people have ever actually made it to the moon. You should also know that there are a lot of people that help other people get to the moon. They work at NASA. Do you know how hard it is to get accepted at NASA? It is literally 80 times harder to get accepted into NASA than it is Harvard. And so I'm always telling people, you got to ask yourself, is your idea, is your dream, is your goal a top one percenter? Because if it's a top one percenter type idea, a top one percenter type dream, you better have top one percenter type habits. Mm -hmm. You better have top one percenter type disciplines. Mm -hmm. Your schedule should look like a top one percenter. Your money should be spent how top one percenters spend their money. And so oftentimes what I'm encountering is people have top one percenter dreams with 99 percentile type habits and expecting extraordinary results from ordinary habits. And that's just not how it works. And so part of the process is, is actually evaluating, okay, where is my idea? Where is my goal? And being able to assess, okay, how hard is this going to be pulled off? And what is it going to cost me in terms of my time, my finances, even relationships to pull this thing off? And that's where I think people often miss the mark. And actually the reason why they fail is because they fail to actually do the pre-planning to actually make their idea happen. We will be right back with more money-making conversations with your host, Rashawn McDonald. Welcome back to Money-Making Conversations with your host, Rashawn McDonald. Well, isn't it, Ryan, also tied to people's perception of what they feel you should be? or you could be, or you should be, and you're not evaluating properly what you want it to be in your life, what the path you want to take, because you hit on that in the book, but I just want to pull yeah. that out and let people hear that coming out, coming from you yeah. in particular, because, you know, you, you can be a great athlete. People think you should go into sports, but then you may have the right. desire to be a doctor. And so, right. so you have to shift in the end. Like you said, you have to be happy with you. And when yeah. you're chasing failure and setting yourself up for success, is the success what you want or success you're trying to achieve for somebody else? Let's talk about that a little yeah. bit, Ryan. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that uh, I like to say God has a plan for your life. Yes. And so do other people. Yes. <laughs> yes. Other people yes. have a plan for where you should work, the car you should drive, the neighborhood you should live in, who you should date, what your kids should do, where your kids should work, where your kids should go to school. I mean, everyone's got their plan for your life. And at some point you got to wake up and ask yourself, am I living out God's plan for my life? Or am I living out somebody else's plan for my life? And so some people, I I talk about in the book, the story of Andre Agassi. Well, in his memoir, I think it came out in 2009. He revealed to us that he didn't really love tennis. Mm -hmm. And you're going, how is one of the greatest tennis players of all time? How does he not like tennis? Mm -hmm. And he goes on to say, my dad liked tennis. Right. And, and so here you, and I, and I, and again, I, I just hope that nobody ever wakes up realizing they've been living out somebody else's passion, somebody else's dream. I can't tell you how many times I've sat with stay at home moms who are now entrepreneurs. And when they first had the ability to stay at home because their husbands made enough money for them to do so, mm-hmm. people would say to them, you're living the dream, right. you're living the dream. And they would be going, whose dream? Mm-hmm. whose dream right that might be your dream but who who said that it's my dream and so there can be some assumptions that we all have of oh they've got it made they right. they've they've got it good 
because of X, Y, and Z, but that doesn't mean that that's something that they actually want it. And so, so those are things that I think we all have to navigate ourselves to go, okay, is this something that is a true desire of my heart to, to do, or am I doing it because someone else has either pressured me to do it, or that was just part of the expectation. I can't tell you how many business owners are just doing the family business mm -hmm. just because it's the family business mm -hmm. and haven't paused long enough to go, what else would you do? And there was so much pressure on them from a very early age that you're going to take this business. In some cases, you're going to take this church. You're going to take this, uh, uh, this medical practice. You're right. going to take this family law. Practice. You're in, and so that, that can bring about tremendous pressure of going, you've already filled in the blank mm -hmm. with my future. Mm -hmm. And so some people don't feel the permission to start over and have a clean slate. And I like to just tell them who, who's making those rules. And, you know, you're in your thirties and forties. I'm pretty sure you get to make a decision about what you want to do with your life. Well, you know, it's really interesting because I always like to share and be honest about, you know, characterization and, and, and examples, you know, chasing failure. Right. I'm talking to Ryan Leak, uh, how falling short sets you up for success. I know that, uh, Early on in my life, you know, my degree is in mathematics, minor in sociology, mm -hmm. but I was very talented in stand up, did everything, deaf comedy jam, did yeah. BET comedy review, everything. You know, so one mm -hmm. that shared stage with everybody from Dave Chappelle to Chris Rock to Martin Lawrence. But yeah. that wasn't my goal. That wasn't my, I just, God just gave me that talent, but everybody saw that as right. my end game. And so when I went to manage Steve Harvey, people were questioning that decision. I, I, mm -hmm. I was very happy. But people were questioning yeah. that. I told them, this is what I want to do. I, I, I love being behind the camera. God gave right. me a gift to be in front of the camera, but I actually love being behind the camera. And I, I yeah. point that out because that's a, that was a, that's a blatant example. Even though I went out and pursued a career as a stand-up comedian, that was my exit plan from IBM, but that wasn't my end plan. And so sometimes right. people only see what they see. And if you have a plan, like you said, in your 30s and 40s, you should be in the position to make your own decisions. Absolutely. And that's really important. And a lot of these examples of whether you whether you're financially success or there's a high degree of popularity, that decision mm -hmm. of where you go, your end game is really tied to you. Correct. Right. Facts. Absolutely. I think people sometimes just get stuck yes. in other people's plans because it's more comfortable. Mm -hmm. You won't get as much criticism. You can acquiesce to the status quo because no one will bother you. Mm -hmm. So you think, right. uh, but I think, I think the world has been given the greatest inventions, mm -hmm. the greatest innovations from people right. that stepped out and took risks. Mm -hmm. And so I just encourage people, Hey, if, if, if you can take a calculated risk, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not, it's chasing failure. It's not chasing foolishness. Okay. Right. right. <laughs> so, but taking calculated risk. Yeah. I, I think you should. I think you should do a lot of math. And if <laughs> the math makes sense, go ahead and go you, for it. You should make a move. You know, the interesting thing about it, like I shared my story about uh, my relationship with uh, how as a stand up comedy, I, I decided to go ahead and become a writer and a very successful mm -hmm. producer and, and marketing and branding expert. Um, even though that wasn't my end game. Now, in your book, I, I you shared I, what I felt was a very funny story. Was your MBA tryout yeah. experience, and I say it was funny because that was a that was a that was a goal. But the yeah. way you approached it and how you pursued it was what yeah. I is, is I think is really what this book is all about. You know, absolutely. You know, you know, emailing MBA teams randomly, emailing them, right? Random, randomly. And that right there, where people say you shouldn't do that, but you're chasing failure right. because you're achieving success. Yeah. Let's talk about that. The reality of of people saying no to you, telling you that mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense, and we hear that a lot about inventions. We hear that a lot about oh, yeah. free agents who make NFL teams. We hear people yeah. who leave leave school early to pursue a career professionally, mm -hmm. or going to a college. Why are you going to an HBCU when you can go to a Harvard? And achieving right. now we have a vice president of the United States. So these are mm -hmm. the things that we hear all the time. But your pursuit right. of an NBA opportunity, a tryout, is is dynamic and very entertaining from a from a yeah. writer's standpoint. But from a personal, it was a passion. Let's talk about that. Yeah. 
Well, I, I think whenever you're trying to do something, people are always going to have their opinions about what you're trying to do. Right. And you can't let that cloud your, your end goal. And you also have to realize for me, you know, trying to get an NBA workout via email, like, <laughs> it's not a, it's, it, again, it really isn't a great right. idea. Via like, email. I would agree with my naysayer. Right. Like that's not a great idea. Yes. That's fine. Yes. I'm still going to do it because I don't have anything else and I'm chasing failure. Mm -hmm. And so what's the worst that can actually happen? A, they don't respond at all. B, they say no. Or C, they say yes. yes. Those are the options. And you won't know which of those options you're going to get if you do nothing. Right. And so I think so many people are afraid of the word no, but it's just a two-letter word. Right. That's it. Mm -hmm. No. I just said it. No. Mm -hmm. No. No. And, and, and so I think so many people can get devastated by the word no, but it just means no. We will be right back with more money-making conversations with your host, Rashawn McDonald. Welcome back to Money-Making Conversations with your host, Rashawn McDonald. But, but, but the yeah. ultimate thing when you talk about this book is the, you know, when you say, at what moment did you find your why? What advice can you give others looking to find theirs? Because I don't know if I found my why. I'll be honest with you, Ryan, because I'm always moving yeah. the moving the needle for the next opportunity. And, but I do know that my why is that I'm living the life that I want to live. I left IBM, right. you know. I have a degree in mathematics, you know. I have a mm -hmm. family that I'm happy to call my wife and my daughter and my, my the staff that works around me support me. Yeah. The building that I bought is the building of my dreams, the car of my dreams. That, that may be the why. But again, yeah. what, what advice can you give to others looking for theirs and how do they find it? Yeah, I, th I think finding your why is is a journey. I don't know that there's a prime age to to get it or a prime season, but when you get it, it'll change your life. Mm -hmm. And for me, I found my why. I, I was working at a church. I was on our executive team, and so I was helping uh, manage a lot of different systems at a at a large church in Dallas. Right. And I was twenty. I was twenty nine years old, mm -hmm. and I was doing a speaking gig, talking about chasing failure um, at a um, at, at a at a corporate engagement and the person that brought me in was like hey i want you to know your story you know literally pulled a boy off the ground mm -hmm. it literally uh, he was living in a crack house mm -hmm. on the ground mm -hmm. and 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 she said hey you know uh we disapprove of our daughter's boyfriend and that was his kid it was his kid but he does love basketball we showed him your documentary and now he's applying for jobs. He called his mom for the first time. You know, he's going to be playing sports and, and a junior college this fall. Like you pulled somebody's life off the ground. And so for me, that was the day I got my why. And it and I enjoyed my 20s, but that gave my 30s a whole new purpose. And I said, I want to spend the rest of my life helping pull people's lives off the floor. Mm -hmm. In every room I walk in, I want to add value. And so that's the filter in which I live my life. Mm -hmm. That's my why. Mm -hmm. Is this adding value Right. to the most people that I possibly can mm -hmm. with the 24 hours I've been given today. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going, I'm on your show right now processing through right. how can I add value to your viewers and your listeners? Right. I write a book and I think who could pick up this book and is it going to add value to their life? And so when you have a why it creates a filtration system for you to decide what you say yes right. to and what you say no to, to go, does it, does it serve, does it serve my why? I'm not going to judge your why because some people's why is money. Right. And that that's kind of what, Hey, I'm, I'm trying to, to make as much money as I possibly can. For some people, I'm trying to make the greatest impact for some people. It's I'm trying to have as much satisfaction as I possibly can. Everybody has a different why and right. your why is your why. But when you don't have one, I think you, you should be asking yourself the question, why am I doing it? Right. And sometimes it's just pausing at, some of us are moving at a pace that's so fast, we haven't even paused long enough to go, why am I doing this? <laughs> why, why, why am I doing They're just moving. Schedule. Right. What's next? Right. What's next? What's right. next? And so what I encourage a person to do is to pause. Is to pause. Sometimes that's an hour. Sometimes that's a day. Sometimes that's a week. Sometimes somebody needs to just go sit on a beach or sit under a cabana and just go, what am I doing in my life? And why am I doing that? And is that a why I can live with? 
Because for some people, they're going, they're doing it for the money. But I know a lot of people who make a lot of money, but they're so busy making the money, they never even get to spend it. Yes. I know people that have $3,500 apartments that they're never in. Mm-hmm. And it's going, I mean, maybe that's your why. Uh, one person could be a lawyer for the money. Another person could be a lawyer for the justice system. Your why is your why. But your why should be something that gets you out of bed in the morning and one that you can live with. We well, you know it's important that you say that when I, when, I, when I listen to you talk, you know, when you use the mm-hmm. word added value. Because I always try to explain to people that you know, your early years, 18 to 25, is when you define what you want to do with your life. You know, that's when you're mm-hmm. eager. That's when you, I guess, you like you said earlier, there's less fear. Your dreams are bigger. They're reachable. Mm-hmm. Because guess what? They're oh, your yeah. dreams. You know, nobody's told you you could fail when you're 18. Right. You're just walking right. out there. And so right. and when I got into my 40s, it was when I took responsibility of my life. When I say that, I mean, mm-hmm. admitted that this is my, I guess you can say my why. And when I look back when I was 18, I realized that all my life I've been adding value to people. You know, whether it was mm-hmm. whether it was tutoring people who was who needed yep. tutoring, whether it was doing events, whether it was pledging my fraternity in college, which changed my whole perspective on life yep. within the community, the uplift, the whole process, the sitcoms that I wrote, the tours that I did. It was always about making people feel good. And it wasn't really yep. about the money. And even the sitcoms and the shows I took, whether it was Sister Sister, whether it was Jamie Foxx show, whether it was the Parkers, whether it was Robert Townsend show or, or doing Family Feud or the Steve Harvey talk show. It was all about uplifting African Americans and showing us in a positive life and not demeaning the principles that we want to be. We just want to fit in. We just want to be appreciated with. And I guess when I yeah. bring that up right now, because when you talk about the why, when you talk about defining yourself, that's why it's important to read a book like this, because sometimes yeah. you can walk through life not really understanding your value, but certain words like adding value, which I've never used in my life, by the way, Ryan, until hmm. Read it in this book and heard you spoke it, speak it on my show. Really mm. locked in exactly who I am. And mm. was, when I read it, I went, "Wow, I got to talk to this guy." Because <laughs> and I was talking to Tristan, you know, my director, one of my EPs on the show, Money Making Conversation. Yeah. And he was saying he, he was asking me because I got two copies. He said, "Rashawn, should I read?" I said, "Yeah." I said, "You should read the book." And he said, "Why?" I said, "Because you know, you go through life." And it will reinforce some of your values or some of the right. things you are doing. And added, adding value to people's lives is what I do. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and can I say this? If you want to make money mm-hmm. in this world, yes. every room you walk in, think to yourself, how can I add value to this yes. room? Mm-hmm. If you do that the rest of your life, you will always make money. Yes. Because you will always be coming up with ideas that add value to the room. And sometimes you have to ask the room what would add the most value. What is it that people need? What is a problem that everybody continues to have? If you can come up with solutions that add value to solve those problems, you will always be making money in some way, shape, or form. If you walk into every job that you have and go, how can I add value to our customers? How can I add yeah. value to my leader? Yes. How can I add value to the CEO? How can I add value to my director, my regional manager? You name it. If you're constantly thinking about adding value to people, you will always be making money. You know, I want to I want to close on this statement from you because it's a really good question. I had my questions and you were sent. I was sent questions by sure. for, for the interview. And one of the questions I have to ask is like, how do you network within your failures? When I say that is that mm-hmm. I, I thought that was the most important question that that I needed to get asked after this interview because failure stops us. Failure shames mm-hmm. us. Failure stops us from actually you know, pursuing our dream because you know, I fail. I'm not going to try it again. And so yeah. how does one network within their failures to achieve yeah. their goals? Own it. <laughs> Own it. Own it. Walk in the room, man. I failed. Haven't you? Right. Mm-hmm. You, 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 have you ever walked in a room full of perfect people? I haven't. Right. And so, yeah, all of us can walk in a room, a networking event, and feel like, well, well let me just, let me hide. Let me hide my shame. Let me, I, I don't want them to know that I, I failed. I don't want them to know that I've made some mistakes. But the common denominator amongst us all is that we all have failures. We all have mistakes. So be the first one in the room to own it. Right. And just go, yeah, I, I failed. What's the difference? Right. 
I, I just owned it and I owned it with a smile on my face. And typically what happens when you own it first, somebody else goes second. In fact, when you own your own failures, you give permission and space for others to fail. And that's what a lot of people I think miss is failure has this uh, ability to isolate you and put you on this mental island where you feel like you're the only one that's ever failed. Mm -hmm. That's just not true. Great book, man. Chasing Failure, How Falling Short Sets You Up for Success by my man, Ryan Leak. Keep winning. And I know you're in Dallas. I'm a Houston boy. I'm going to let you off the hook, okay? <laughs> All right, man. <laughs> Appreciate you. If you want to hear or right. see any of my Money Making Conversation interviews, please go to moneymakingconversation.com. I'm Rashawn McDonald. I am your host.